So this video is going to cover carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy and how it is similar or different to proton NMR spectroscopy. And we're also going to talk about carbon-13 depth experiments and what they can tell us about our molecule. So if we compare a proton and a carbon NMR spectrum, you'll notice that there are a few similarities and differences. Um, first thing you'll notice is that the scale is different. So on a proton NMR, you're generally looking between about 0 and 12, 13 ppm. Most of your signal is coming between 0 and 9 or so. On a carbon uh, NMR, the scale is much longer, so you're looking between 0 and about 220 ppm. You'll also notice that uh, most of the signals in a carbon NMR uh, don't have any splitting. They all appear as what you might call singlets in a proton NMR, whereas in proton NMR we do see signal splitting. You'll also notice that on carbon NMR you don't get the integrated trace like you do on proton NMR. So these integration curves here generally don't appear on a carbon-13 NMR. So we'll discuss why some of the differences uh, are the way that they are, but um, there are some similarities. So in previous videos I talked about chemical shift and the effects of shielding and deshielding. Now this is exactly the same on a carbon NMR as it is on a proton NMR. So the effects that shield and deshield protons um, are the same as those that shield and deshield carbons. It's to do with the amount of electron density surrounding the nucleus in question. Now, another practical difference between these two is that proton NMRs typically take around one minute to run, whereas carbon-13 NMRs can take around 15 to 30 minutes to run. And we'll come across some of the reasons why that is uh, in this video. So, I mentioned that there's no integrated trace on the carbon-13 spectrum. Now, we're used to, on um, proton NMR spectra, Seeing the integrated trace values like this, you might sometimes see the numbers uh, written underneath, but that's just a translation of this integrated trace line. And we discussed in the video on integration that uh, the ratio of the integrals of all of these signals gives us the ratio of the proton nuclei that went into making them. So in this case, we can say this is a 1 to 2 to 1 to 2 to 2 to 3 integration ratio, um, just based on the size of the integrals. And therefore, this was caused by that ratio of protons. So it could be 1 to 2 to 1 to 2 to 2 to 3, or it could be 2 to 4 to 2 to 4 to 4 to 6, and so on. Any compound ratio of that, those numbers. Now in a carbon-13 NMR, um, you won't see the integrated trace used routinely, uh, and that's because uh, carbon-13 works in a slightly different way. So carbon-13 has what we call a longer relaxation time than proton, so the integration tends not to be as reliable. Now as an example, I've just ex uh, extracted some um, carbon-13 signals from a single spectrum. So I've bunched them all together, but these all these signals are from the same spectrum, and they all um, are caused by a single carbon nucleus. So none of them are 2C or 3C signals or anything like that. Um, and you can see that they're all different sizes, you can see that they're all slightly different widths, and you have to take my word for it, but I've integrated all of these signals using NMR processing software, and some of these signals have less than 40% the area of others. So if it worked the same way as in a proton, you would expect all of these to have the same integration. Um, as it is, they don't. So carbon-13 integration is generally not that reliable. So we don't do it as standard. The other main difference between um, proton and carbon NMR is the natural isotopic abundance of each of those elements. So in natural hydrogen, 99.98% uh, of your hydrogen is 1H, or proton, uh, and only 0.02% is 2H, or deuterium. Now, the, this has a, uh, implications on your running your samples, because if you take a standard sample like this, 99.98% um, of the protons in this sample are going to be NMR active. So all the ones that I've highlighted in purple here are going to contribute to your proton NMR signal. And that means A, that 99.98% of your sample is responding to the, uh, the spectrometer, so that makes your sample sensitive. And this is one of the reasons why proton NMR takes much less time to run than carbon NMR. But you also see things like proton-proton coupling, because your protons are so abundant in your sample, you can see things like proton-proton coupling between different chemical environments in the same molecule. Now, if we take a look at carbon, um, natural carbon is 98.9% .9 carbon-12 and only 1.1% carbon-13. Now, the issue is that carbon-12 doesn't have spin, so it's NMR inactive. 
So when we're doing carbon-13 NMR, that's the reason why we have to use carbon-13, is because carbon-13 is the isotope which is spin-active, which responds to the NMR spectrometer. Now, because the NMR active isotope is only 1.1% of your sample, that means that whenever you're putting your powder or your oil or whatever it is into your NMR tube, only 1.1% of the carbon atoms in that sample are going to respond to the NMR spectrometer. So, um, looking at the same sample that we looked at the proton NMR for, only one of the carbons in all of these molecules um, is going to give a response when we run a carbon-13 NMR spectrum. And that makes the carbon NMR inherently less sensitive. So that's one of the things that contributes to it um, taking 15 minutes to half an hour to run as compared to protons taking one minute to run. The other being that carbon has a much slower relaxation time. The other thing it means is that we generally don't see coupling between carbon-13 nuclei. Because if you imagine this sample here, the odds of you having two carbon-13 nuclei directly next door to each other so that they could undergo coupling is very small indeed. So that's why that's one of the reasons why we don't see carbon-13, carbon-13 coupling in our carbon-13 NMR spectrum. So we don't see carbon-13, carbon-13 coupling, but carbon-13 and proton are both spin-active elements. So we can see uh, carbon-13 proton coupling. So if we look at this, um, this spectrum of norbornane here, Norbornane has three chemical environments in it. And if we look at the carbon-13 NMR of norbornane, it looks pretty much how we would expect. We don't see any splitting patterns or anything like that. And we see three carbon signals for the three carbon-13 chemical environments that are in the molecule. Um, however, we do have carbon-13 proton coupling present. We just switch it off as standard. So this is what we call broadband proton decoupling. So carbon-13 experiments ordinarily would show coupling between the carbons and the protons that are attached to them, but we turn it off to make the, the carbon-13 spectrum easier to interpret. So this is a broadband decoupled carbon-13 spectrum. You sometimes see this as a, uh, a proton in kind of wiggly brackets, um, but this is, this is the routine way that we do it. We basically broadband decouple all of the carbons from the protons. If we turn off that decoupling, this is what we see. So you can see actually the signals do split out, and I'll just bounce back and forth between those two spectra. So you can see here are the three signals um, correlated onto the chemical environments. If we turn off the decoupling, you can see that the splitting uh, actually is there. And you can see that it's, it's between the carbon and the proton. So signal one, for instance, has one proton attached to it, and we're getting coupling between this carbon and this proton, so it's giving us a doublet signal here. Um, whereas if we look at the green protons over here, there are two attached to this carbon. So because it's, this carbon is coupling to two protons, we're ending up with a triplet type pattern. But as I say, we routinely turn this off and pretty much all the carbon-13 spectra you will see will be broadband decoupled as standard. So these effects can explain some of the things that may have been uh, that you may have noticed in the spectra that I've been showing you so far. Uh, and these are some of the signals that I've not really explained, like these two here, shown in blue and red. Now, what these are is the, uh, the solvent that we're running the NMR spectrum in. And in this case, it's uh, deuterated chloroform, or CdCl3. Now, when we make deuterated chloroform, um, there is a small amount of protic chloroform in it. So it's depending on the quality of the chloroform you've got, it's generally around 99.8% deuterium and 0.2% proton. Now, the reason we use deuterated NMR solvents is so that the, the proton signal doesn't show up in the proton spectrum, because otherwise it would drown everything else out, because the, the, the solvent is in a vast excess over your sample. Um, but this little impurity of uh, protic chloroform is what gives you the NMR signal over here. So you can actually see uh, the signal for chloroform in your proton NMR spectrum. And it's just due to that little impurity of protic uh, chloroform. Whereas if we look at the carbon spectrum, um, what we're actually seeing down here is carbon-13 that's present in um, CdCl3, but we're seeing it coupling to the deuterium. And you might say, well, didn't we decouple the protons from the carbons? Well, yes, we did. We decoupled the protons from the carbons. We did not decouple the deuterons from the carbons. So the reason that you see this um, 
the, the, this signal appearing in the, the carbon-13 NMR is because some of the, uh, the carbon that's in the, in the CDCL3 is carbon-13, and we didn't decouple carbon from deuterium. So this appears as a triplet because deuterium has a different uh, spin number to, to uh, hydrogen, to proton hydrogen. So therefore it appears as a triplet when you get a single coupling between one deuterium and the carbon. So that's just where that signal appears from. But you'll see it in, in every carbon-13 NMR spectrum that you run uh, in CDCL3. So this concept of carbons coupling with protons uh, allows us to run pulse sequences which basically tell us a lot more about a molecule than just the carbon-13 spectrum alone. And these experiments are called DET, so Distortionless Enhancement by Polarization Transfer. And they come in a number of different flavours. So the most common ones are DET45, DET90 and DET135. And what they're going to do is allow us to differentiate um, how many protons are attached to each of these carbon signals. So are they quaternary carbons where there's no protons attached? Are they CH, CH2 or CH3 signals? So a DET45 spectrum um, basically all of the quaternary carbons will disappear and everything else will be will remain on the spectrum. In a DEPT-90 spectrum, everything will disappear apart from the CH protons, the CH carbons, sorry. And in a DEPT-135 spectrum, the quaternary carbons will disappear. The CH and the CH3 carbons will appear in one direction, either above or below the baseline. And the CH2 carbons will appear on the opposite side of the baseline. So let's have a look at what these look like. So to start with, a DEPT-45 spectrum. So I'll just bounce back and forth between the carbon-13 and the DEPT-45. So all of the signals that have disappeared out of this spectrum must be quaternary carbons, so ones with no protons attached. And notice that the CDCL3 signal here disappears uh, because it doesn't have any protons attached. It just has a deuterium attached. If we look at a DEPT-90 spectrum now, Everything disappears apart from the CH signals. So this tells you obviously that these ones only have a, a single hydrogen attached. And if we go to a DEPT-135 spectrum, now some of the signals have moved below the baseline. Uh, the reason that I call this A and B rather than positive or negative or something like that is that you're not guaranteed to get you know, CH3 and CH on one side above and CH2 below. It might be the other way around. So it could look like this, and it's up to you to work out which is which. The final experiment I just want to briefly talk about is JMOD. Um, JMOD basically reintroduces the quaternary carbons, so it's similar to a DEPT-135, only the quaternary carbons appear, and they're in the same direction as the CH2s. So a JMOD spectrum looks a bit like this. But from my own personal point of view, I think JMOD is a bit redundant because if you've run a carbon-13 spectrum and you've run a DEPT-135 spectrum, that kind of gives you all the information that you need because anything that disappears out of the carbon-13 spectrum is a quaternary, so we know that all of these are quaternary carbons. Anything that moves onto one side of the baseline is a CH2. Everything on the other side is CH or CH3. And it's kind of up to you to look at the molecule that you're analysing and make your assignments based on that. So for instance, I know that there's only one CH2 um, chemical environment in this molecule, so therefore the signal which flipped to the opposite side of the baseline must be CH2. Um, that leaves all of these as CH or CH3 signals. And if you're thinking, well, how do you tell between CH and CH3 signals? That's usually just an issue of the region of the spectrum that they're in, and also the structure of your molecule. Um, this region over here tends to be where the aromatics come, and you can't really have a CH3 on an aromatic system, right? These tend to be CHs. So you can start to narrow it down based on that. Um, I also know that there's an ethyl group in this molecule, so there's a CH3 unaccounted for somewhere, so therefore this must be the CH3. Uh, it just basically uh, it gives you an extra layer of information that you can then use to aid your structural assignments.